This episode of Metro Center Presents is brought to you in part by the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies and the Orlando Sentinel. Hello everyone, I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies. The launch of Atlantis marked the end of the space shuttle program. What happens next? With NASA, with the space industry. Coming up on Florida Forward, conversations about the future. Well, in 1981, the United States launched the first space shuttle mission uh, from Kennedy Space Center. There were two astronauts aboard. It's 30 years and 134 launches have passed since then, and about 350 astronauts have uh, been put into orbit around, uh, around Earth. We have, happen to have three of them up here today. Um, three weeks from today, on uh, July 8th, the United States is scheduled to launch Atlantis on the final shuttle mission with the final four astronauts. This morning, we're fortunate to have a distinguished panel of uh, experts to talk about uh, what's next for the U.S. space program. Our first panelist is uh, U.S. Senator Bill Nelson. Uh, Senator Nelson was elected to the Florida legislature in 1972 and to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1978 and the Florida cabinet in 1994. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2000 and he currently serves as chairman of the Science and Space Subcommittee. And as many of you know, uh, Senator Nelson was a payload specialist on the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia in January 1986. Senator Nelson? You can just stay right there. Good morning, and thank you for being here uh, early this morning. And so many people in this audience who have been such a great part of this program over the years. Uh, thank you for the extraordinary talent that you have brought for your dedication. Uh, you think back to those old days uh, when we were literally flying by the seat of our pants, uh, when uh, not only did uh, we try to figure out how to uh, handle humans in zero gravity, but we were swatting mosquitoes uh, as uh, as they carved out of the wilderness over there at the Cape, a whole new uh, technical mission. And um, of course that was at a time that we were shocked into the reality uh, because the Soviets had beat us into space, first with Sputnik and then with the first human to orbit the Earth, Gargarin. But then America with its back to the wall, uh, the can-do spirit that we have, got up and did the business. Now, uh, as mentioned earlier, there is a perception that we do not have a clear path. The fact is, and I'm very uh, interested and appreciative of having this opportunity with this, this distinguished panel to try to show you that there is a clear path forward. There wasn't a year and a half ago, and if you read the headlines a year and a half ago, you will see very questionable questions about which way the space program was going. But today, as a result of the passage of the NASA bill last year, and that happened in the fall, uh, what we have is a clear path. We have extension of the International Space Station that was under previous law going to be shut down at 2015. Of course now that's extended to 2020. Uh, just a few weeks ago there were 12 human beings on board an International Space Station that's 120 yards long. Uh, we have the clear direction of the development of the commercial rockets with a great deal of promise that those costs are coming down considerably and those commercial rockets 
One likely will launch with cargo, rendezvous and dock with cargo later this year. Another company early next year. And then those are starting to be man-rated with escape systems and redundancy. And that will be our space taxi to and from the International Space Station. The other path is development of the big rocket that will let NASA do what NASA does best, which is explore the heavens by the heavy lift rocket, and we'll get into the details on that, to get components up into Earth orbit and then go out and explore the heavens. And the president has set the goal of Mars. And as we get into the discussion, I want to tell you about some of the exciting technologies of getting to Mars in 39 days instead of the 10 months that would be required here uh, under conventional technology. In the process, there is great human concern and tragedy because in the layoffs that are occurring, particularly after the end of the last shuttle launch, anytime there are layoffs, that's a great concern. We have in the progress and in the plan saved about what otherwise would have been a half of those layoffs as the Kennedy Space Center will ramp back up, having gone from 14,000 about a year ago, ultimately down to 8,000, will ramp back up to about 10,500. Remember, there's another 10,000 across the river over at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, and we can talk about the programs in that ramping up. And then the final thing is, the funding that occurred after the NASA uh, authorization bill. We were able to keep in all of the cuts that went to all the agencies of federal government, those cuts to NASA quite limited. Now the question is in the future, and of course you know the extraordinary situation that we're facing with the deficit and the debt ceiling and all of that, uh, I am still optimistic that we're going to be able to keep NASA well compared to other agencies. Thank you, Mike. Senator, thank you. Our next panelist is uh, Robert Cabana, who currently serves as the director of Kennedy Space Center. Mr. Cabana is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and was a colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps. He flew on the space shuttle four times, twice as pilot and twice as commander. His most recent mission was in 1998. Since then, he served as Deputy Director of Johnson Space Center in Houston and Director of the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Mr. Cabana? Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today to uh, share what I see as a clear path forward. Uh, everybody thinks the Kennedy Space Center is closing uh, with the last shuttle mission, and let me assure you, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I do believe we have a great future. Uh, we are going to transform the Kennedy Space Center into the multi-user uh, launch complex of the future. And uh, there's a lot that goes on uh, during this transition. I think if you look at, you know, we've got, still have the launch services program at KSC that procures all our expendable rockets for our NASA science missions. And we've got some great ones coming up. We just launched Aquarius from the West Coast to study the salinity of the oceans and their impact on our environment. Uh, we're getting ready to launch a mission to uh, Jupiter, a mission to the moon, and uh, at the end of this year, the Mars Science Lab that's going to take a rover to Mars that's the size of a, a Volkswagen Beetle. And uh, that is a great program, work that's done at KSC. Uh, we have the commercial crew program at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, preparing the way for commercial operations in low Earth orbit, uh, cargo and crew to get our crews to and from the International Space Station in the future. That is an exciting program. We're going to make that happen. We're going to enable commercial space at KSC. Uh, we do have a path forward on a heavy lift launch vehicle. Earlier uh, this year, I'm sure you read that uh, the administrator announced that uh, the Orion spacecraft was going to be the multi-purpose crew vehicle on this heavy lift rocket. That uh, vehicle is going to be processed and uh, taken care of, built at the Kennedy Space Center in the ONC building 
that in partnership with the state of Florida was refurbished uh, for that specific purpose. Uh, we are working on defining the architecture for the heavy lift rocket that is going to launch that spacecraft. Um, uh, we are laying out all the reasons, the facts, why we are going to have the right rocket uh, for this purpose. And it will be indisputable when we get done that with the budget we have, it meets the requirements, it's evolvable, and will support us as we continue uh, to prepare for exploration beyond our home planet, providing an architecture that allows us eventually to go to Mars, but can go to the moon, uh, you know, asteroids, Lagrange points, you name it. And uh, we're making that happen at, uh, at KSC. So it changes heart. You know, whether the shuttle program ended this year or five years from now, it was still going to be uh, very traumatic. It has been, you know, the heart of NASA's space program uh, for the last 30 years. We couldn't have built the International Space Station without it. And we have come accomplished phenomenal things. But it's time to transition to the future. And I believe uh, we are going to have a good future if we enable this, if we do it right. Uh, we can support commercial operations as well as a NASA program that does the hard things that nobody else can do and allows us to explore beyond our home planet. So looking forward to further uh, discussion on these topics with this panel. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Garrett Reisman recently joined SpaceX as a senior engineer working on the company's manned space program. Uh, Dr. Reisman is the project manager for Dragon Rider. It's an effort at SpaceX to develop the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon capsule to carry astronauts into space. Uh, Dr. Reisman also is a former astronaut, logging uh, two shuttle flights and three months aboard the International Space Station. Interestingly to me, at least, while he's uh, flown to the heights of space, he also spent uh, two weeks at the bottom of the sea uh, living in the Aquarius habitat off the coast of Florida. Dr. Reisman? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. So it, it, what you said is true. Just about uh, three and a half months ago, I was still a NASA astronaut, and I could tell you that it was very difficult to leave that position voluntarily, as these two guys over here were also a, a, a test. The, uh, I, I won't lie to you, being an astronaut is the coolest job ever. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's a hard thing to turn your back on, although I suspect it's much easier if you get to return to your day job as a U.S. Senator, so it's <laughs> kind of cushions the blow. <laughs> but <laughs> but what, uh, what I ended up doing was I looked around, and I looked around at uh, what was happening in the commercial space arena, and I got very excited. What I saw was a lot of different companies doing some really innovative things and uh, making some great progress. And I, I concluded that that's our future for getting people to low Earth orbit. Commercial space is the place to be. So I uh, reluctantly hung up my spacesuit and I, I signed up with uh, what I thought was the leader of this group, which was SpaceX. SpaceX, the company I work for now, was founded in 2002 by Elon Musk. And it started out with just two employees and uh, have, it, this company has come a long way. Currently, we have over 1,300 employees, and we have facilities uh, in Los Angeles, and also here at Florida, we have our, all of our launch operations and a launch pad at uh, Cape Canaveral. And uh, we also have a, a rocket testing facility in McGregor, Texas, I should mention. So in that short period of time, SpaceX designed, developed, and test a bunch of different rockets and spacecraft. We created uh, the Falcon 1, the Falcon 9, and then the Dragon spacecraft. We've launched the Falcon 9 twice. Both times have worked fantastically. And the second time the Falcon 9 was launched was just last December. And on that flight, we had the Dragon capsule, the Dragon spacecraft, flew for the first time. It orbited the Earth twice and splashed down into the Pacific. And we became the first commercial company to orbit a vehicle and bring it back from, from Earth orbit. So. In fact, that day I was flying a NASA T-38, and I landed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And the line crew came up, they saw NASA on the side of the airplane, and they said, hey, congratulations on that great Dragon flight. That's awesome. And I had to tell them, well, it was kind of SpaceX, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll take it. You know, we're all very, very excited about it because that was a, a partnership with uh, SpaceX and NASA. 
so as was already mentioned by uh, Senator Nelson, later this year, the Dragon will fly again, and we're gonna take the Dragon this time all the way to the space station, and we intend to unload some cargo and then bring some things home. So that'll be another uh, great step forward. All of these Dragon and, and, and Falcon 9 launches I'm talking about uh, leave from right here in Florida. Our launch pad is at, at Cape Canaveral. We have uh, 60 employees there right now and a payroll of about $5 million, but we intend to greatly expand that. And it's all tied to launch rate. So as we get more and more launches out of that facility, uh, we intend to go up. In fact, we, we think that uh, we can get over 400 employees by about 2015, maybe going to 600 employees when we get to full capacity. So my job, though, is, is not that. My job is to take this, this cargo ship, the Dragon capsule, that brings, uh, ho hopefully just a couple months, is going to bring cargo to the space station and come back to modify that to carry people. Now, there's a couple things you need to do differently when you start talking about putting people in there. At least people in there want to come back. Right. <laughs> so uh, you have to have additional redundancy, additional safety. And the biggest thing for us is we have to design a launch abort system. What that means is, just like on a Gemini and Apollo, uh, you have a, another rocket that, if something's going bad during ascent, can pull the capsule away and, and make sure the crew remains safe and has a nice ride back down into the Atlantic Ocean while all, all the bad things are happening over here. So that's a difficult engineering challenge that we are focusing on over the next year. We got a contract from NASA for $75 million to work on this. And in addition, we're also working concurrently on all the crew accommodations. So everything the crew needs, like spacesuits, seats, uh, life support systems, and all that kind of stuff. So that's what, I, that's what I'm doing uh, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and I gotta tell you, I'm having a lot of fun. It's not every day. Uh, it was, it's actually more common to get a chance to ride in a spaceship than it is to get a chance to actually design one that's gonna fly. And so for, uh, before, I was an engineer, uh, before I was an astronaut, I was an engineer, and I can tell you it's very, very exciting. Uh, and we plan to fly the first Dragon with people in it about three years from, from today. So I just want to end by saying commercial space, what we're doing right here, is, is, is very cost effective and I believe is, is definitely the way forward for getting people into low Earth orbit. We've uh, worked with NASA using fixed price commercial contracts. Now contracting is key to this endeavor and it's not something that you'll see in all the headlines, but it's really uh, what has enabled this relationship to develop. These contracts are milestone driven, so if we don't perform, if we don't do what we agreed to do, we don't get paid. So, and also we get to leverage private investment. SpaceX invested $300 million of its own money towards the development of the Falcon 9 and the, and the Dragon uh, capsule. So using these private enterprise practices, we were able to achieve some pretty remarkable cost-saving results. And I'll just give you a quick example. We designed, built, and tested and f that Falcon 1 rocket, the Falcon 9 rocket, the Dragon spacecraft. We built our whole factory in, uh, in, in Hawthorne and all of our engineering facilities. We also built our launch pad here in Florida and all of the operation facilities and another launch pad out in the South Pacific. All of that we did for $800 million in a span of eight years. Now, <laughs> thanks. Now, $800 million, is sound, it, it still might sound like a lot of money. I know I would love to have $800 million. But in reality, that is 10 times less expensive than it usually takes to do this type of work. So there's a, a model that, the Na that NASA and the Air Force used to predict how much it costs to make a rocket. That model said that to build the Falcon 9 alone, just the Falcon 9, not all that other stuff, it would cost $4 billion. The true cost that it, that it took was $300 million. So we're, we're a real game changer. We're, we're driving the cost of getting the space down by a factor of 10. So just to echo and, and conclude, uh, echo the words of, of the Senator, our goal in the commercial space flight area is to kind of take over that job of getting people into low Earth orbit. And by doing so, create a national infrastructure, a national industry to, to do that job, which NASA has been doing very well for almost 50 years now. What that will do is it'll free up NASA and NASA's budgets to go beyond and use that heavy lift rocket to go out, go to back to the moon, go to Mars, asteroids, all kinds of really amazing things without having to deal with the drudgery of getting just from here to 200 miles above here. Uh, so we're, I, I truly believe we're entering a golden age of spaceflight. It's a very exciting time to be an engineer in the space business. 
because uh, you see all these companies, it's not just us, there's competition, which also drives down price. And we have uh, you know, all these interesting designs that are very different coming from all the different companies uh, participating. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in the future, this will, what this will lead to, if you look really far ahead, is a day where access to space is opened up to everyone. It's not just a few lucky guys that, that get to go, but everybody who wants to go will have that opportunity. I thank you for your attention. Alan Stern is a planetary scientist and an associate vice president and special advisor to the president of the Southwest Research Institute. He previously was NASA's associate administrator for all science missions and following his appointment in 2007 was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. In addition to his uh, capacity with Southwest Research, he's privately advised uh, numerous emerging space companies like Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. Dr. Stern? Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well, sitting with these four guys, I feel like the requisite geek um, at the table. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming this morning. It's great to see such interest. And of course, here in Florida, it's very important to have that interest among uh, leaders like yourselves uh, uh, because of the situation with the Space Coast. But um, I actually want to start with a little bit of a story. Uh, this morning I saw something uh, uh, that uh, I can't help but tell you about. Uh, as we were uh, uh, waiting for the breakfast to be served, I saw a father uh, bring his son up to Garrett and introduce him, a little, what looked like a five or six year old little guy. And, uh, and Garrett encouraged to uh, talk to the little guy and, and uh, encouraged him to uh, take more science and math courses because that's the training to be an astronaut. And what struck me about that, besides Garrett's uh, generosity, was the same thing happened to me when I was a little boy with a guy named Wally Shara back in the Apollo days. And it motivated me very strongly. And so I thank you for what you just did uh, this morning. I'm sure you do it a lot. The space program is a tremendous motivator uh, for um, uh, youth in our country. Um, I think we've lost a little bit of that, but I think we're going to get it back. I'm very optimistic. Um, it really fires people up uh, to think about uh, exploring the heavens. The reason I went into science was be in part because of that encounter with Wally Shara in 1969. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it fueled me up to do things that were, a lot of my friends talked about um, but didn't go on to do, to actually uh, go into physics rather than in business. Uh, uh, to go on to get uh, a graduate degree in aerospace engineering and a PhD in astrophysics, uh, to start flying things on the space shuttle. In fact, the first space shuttle mission uh, that I was principal investigator on was called STS-61C, and that was Senator Nelson's mission in uh, January 1986. And I went on to uh, uh, lead a number of uh, unmanned missions, uh, flew more things on the shuttle, uh, it's really a dream career to be in the space program. I got to fly F-18s for four years with NASA, uh, doing science in the back seat, and perhaps the greatest honor in my life was being chosen by Mike Griffin to be uh, associate administrator and to lead the science program, everything from those Mars rovers to the Hubble Space Telescope and 90 other missions that are going on, either in development or uh, in flight. Um, but I, uh, let, when I left the agency, I looked around and I thought, you know, I'm 50 years old. And uh, I know what 15 or 20 more years in a career means now. Um, where can I make the biggest contribution? Uh, and I chose to uh, uh, split my time between uh, continuing a scientific career and to become involved in commercial space. Uh, I'm very excited about the entrepreneurial aspect. I'm, I'm a big supporter of diversifying our portfolio. Uh, in space. I don't think, particularly in this time, uh, that the government can do everything. Uh, there are so many demands on the, the federal budget and, and limited resources that we have to leverage where we can. And there's an old saying, you know, uh, if you only own one stock, you probably deserve what you get if it goes down. Uh, and that's another argument for uh, diversifying your portfolio. I'm also a big believer in American leadership. And we have led in so many ways in space exploration, um, in the human spaceflight program and the robotic program in terms of scientific discoveries that, that um, a great projection of America across the world to students in every country. Um, but um, I see the emergence of commercial space as a new kind of American leadership in space. After all, we have a capitalist economy and the success 
of uh, commercial space firms is all about the success of business people and the American economy. In addition to, not in replacement for, but in addition to um, what NASA can do for us at the leading edge of science and technology and exploration. So I think as we talk this morning, I hope that we can, we can stress those themes, and I'll say thanks again. Thanks. Dale Ketchum is the director of the University of Central Florida's Spaceport Research and Technology Institute. He's a lifelong resident of the Space Coast and has spent his career in association with a space program in Florida. That career included the shuttle contractor Rockwell, director of space and defense programs for Enterprise Florida, and district director for former Congressman Jim Backus. Mr. Ketchum. Thank you. I, ge I guess if, if Alan was the geek, I'm the anti-geek, because clearly um, I, I'm honored to be up here with three astronauts, a center, a center director, and, and someone of the academic uh, and research uh, credentials of Alan. I guess I'm here primarily because I've, I've lived here all my life. My father uh, moved us from Miami to, he was the first city manager at Cocoa Beach when Cocoa Beach was becoming what it became uh, as a result of the growth of the space program. And he moved us up here in uh, 1955. I was not very big in 1955. I learned to walk on Cocoa Beach. And I was inspired by the space program, although for somewhat less lofty reasons. I grew up in Cocoa Beach with the original seven astronauts, and they were really, really cool. Um, <laughs> but they were really neat in the sense of driving they were all driving Jim Rathman Corvettes, and they owned the city of, of Cocoa Beach. It, but it was also true that Cocoa Beach at that time, there were a heck of a lot of topless bars. Uh, it, it, was, it was an inspiration to, uh, hey, I want to grow up and be an astronaut. Uh, so there are different ways to inspire youth, I suppose. Um, but I, I, I've grown up, uh, spent my entire working life m either indirectly or mostly directly working in the space program. And from my focus, um, I think one of my big, one of the main drivers that I have for motivating me every day is I grew up, particularly most formatively when I was working for Rockwell for a decade back in the early days of the shuttle program. And even though it was clear that Florida could do so much more and do it so much cheaply, so much more cheaply that would allow tax dollars to then be redirected to other more noble programs. Um, we were getting shafted uh, by the political clout of our friends in Texas or Alabama, or particularly in the early days of the shuttle out of uh, Downey, California, where the shuttle program, Rockwell, uh, did its work. So in, when I went to work with uh, Enterprise Florida, when I interviewed for the job, I articulated that, you know, he said, why do you want to be director of our space program, uh, space policy division? And I said, well, I'm tired of getting shafted by Alabama and California and Texas. And he said, so your motivation is vengeance? And I said, yeah, I got the job. Um, the, and, and, and what, what, what uh, I'm, I'm honored to work in, in the field that I am now because I not only work for University of Central Florida, which I'm very proud to do, they're a great organization and they're very involved in trying to help uh, diversify the role that Kennedy Space Center is going to have in the future. Uh, I also work for Space Florida and I also work for the EDC of Brevard County and that enables me to wear a number of hats and that keeps me from if I have a bunch of bosses, then if I say something that really ticks somebody off, my bosses have cover, can they, they can say he did it because he was working for the other guy. So that, that, that provides me with a great deal of cover. And one of the things that we were very effective in utilizing that for is, if you recall in the last presidential election, we were successful in elevating the issue of America's space program uh, to a profile in the national campaign that it had never had before. And we were very successful. We were briefing the candidates even during the uh, uh, nomination process, having them come to Bavard County and listen to our industry. And uh, because it was, it's, it, it's not rocket science, it's simple political math. 
Kennedy Space Center is the eastern anchor of the I-4 corridor in the largest purple state in the Union. This is, quite frankly, um, the single most important piece of political real estate in a presidential election. And I'm sure you guys know that more money comes into the I-4 corridor, late staff, late commercial buys for President of the United States than anywhere else in the country. And the eastern anchor of that I-4 corridor is Kennedy Space Center, and we have been v increasingly anxious for almost a decade now, understanding what we were gonna, what's going to happen to us. And it was our job to exploit that advantage. Florida has, in competing with states like Alabama and Mississippi and elsewhere, when they elect a senator, they intend that he's going to stay there till he's dead. Because eventually, before he dies, he's going to get a, his hand on the gavel of an appropriations subcommittee. And Florida has a habit of churning its elected officials. And we, we don't, Senator Nelson has not been there long enough to, to get there. And I think that's a good argument for his reelection. We need to ha make sure that we get, his, get him a, an appropriations <laughs> committee gavel. So we don't have the heft, we, we don't have the seniority, but we do have this electoral college status, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a card we need to leverage aggressively. And so we, we were able to get uh, uh, Senator McCain and Senator Obama down here to come down, and, and they basically gave us both the same promise that they would, you know, they would come and save us. Now, that was great, I'd rather have the promise than not, but Senator McCain was lucky because he lost and then didn't have to back up that promise. Uh, there really, most of us knew at that time when they both said that, that there was really no way uh, they were gonna come and save us. The, the program was destined for major transformation. It was necessary. Uh, and we were gonna be in a world of hurt. So we are hoping to continue that policy going into the next presidential election, and uh, we're, we're well ahead of schedule because we were somewhat caught flat-footed, uh, if you noticed in the debates in New Hampshire uh, earlier this week. Uh, our issue came up in a gubernatorial uh, GOP debate in New Hampshire. We were planning on that. There's a debate here in Orlando for the GOP candidates in September of this year, and we were all geared up to leverage that. Um, so our timetable has, has accelerated, but we're going to be pushing this issue as aggressively as we can to see to it that Florida gets its share of the program going forward. And on that, I'll shut up. Thank you. Very well. Okay, well, thanks, everybody, for those opening remarks. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, uh, pose a couple of questions that I hope that uh, the group here will, uh, will discuss. Uh, have a conversation about. I uh, wanted to start off with uh, actually something that Senator Nelson uh, got ahead of me on, but uh, maybe somebody else up here would like to comment on it. Uh, there was a column in uh, USA Today on May 25th written by Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, Jim Lovell, who gra gave uh, uh, commanded Apollo 13 and gave Tom Hanks a great role in the movie, uh, Gene Cernan, the last man on the moon, and they wrote in it, uh, today America's leadership in space is slipping. Uh, NASA's human spaceflight program is in substantial disarray with no clear-cut mission in the offing. Uh, they say after a half century of remarkable progress, a coherent plan for maintaining America's leadership in space, uh, space exploration is lo no longer apparent. Does somebody else want to comment on that? Or, or is there uh, validity to what they're saying? Or are they just off base? Well, from a human space point of view, I mean, we have a cruise on the International Space Station right now. We're going to continue to fly it out till uh, at least 2020 in our agreements with our international partners. Uh, no, we don't have the shuttle to take supplies and crews to the space station right now, and we have to rely on our Russian partners for uh, crew transport uh, to and from. But uh, I think developing the commercial capability to do that is a path forward. I mean, we've been going back and forth to low Earth orbit for 50 years now, and we know what it takes to do that. And to turn that over to a commercial company to develop a vehicle to do that, I think, is very reasonable. As far as a path forward uh, beyond low Earth orbit, I think it's critical to the future of our country that we explore beyond our home planet. And the uh, space launch system that we're developing with the uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle is 
what is going to enable us to do that. So I do think we have a path forward. We just have to make it work. Mike, I'll chip in. Uh, uh, with all due respect to those uh, uh, Apollo commanders, um, I think that uh, while this is a time of change, certainly, uh, that there are tremendous signs of American leadership in space. Tell me what other country has a, uh, the capabilities that we do to put orbiters around Saturn, spacecraft to Pluto, uh, automobile-sized vehicles on Mars. Tell me what other country um, is uh, developing uh, commercial human space flight uh, for space tourism. Five separate suborbital lines all being created uh, by American companies. Uh, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, uh, Masten Space Systems, Armadillo Aerospace, x -Corps. Those are all American companies. Um, I don't know any country other than the United States that's um, uh, putting orbital taxis the way that uh, SpaceX is together as well as uh, orbital sciences. I think those are all important signs of American leadership and I'd like to see uh, uh, more people recognize that because it's such a fundamental part in my view of what we're about as a uh, free enterprise country. Um, now, I think that there's also a big question about our future in human space exploration beyond Earth orbit. Um, we have, uh, fortunately, in the last 10 years, uh, really crystallized uh, uh, the political establishment around uh, a unified position, which is, and I think a lot of that came after the Columbia uh, accident in 2003, that it's not enough to simply send um, brave astronauts to low Earth orbit. Uh, that we need to go places that are, um, uh, pardon me for putting it so, so crudely, but uh, that are worth dying for. Uh, that we set landmarks and flags and that we do research that's worthy of the risk that's being taken. Um, there is a, uh, a significant question how we're going to proceed, but there are also great glimmers out there. It's a little early, but uh, you may have heard about a company called Space Adventures, which has just announced uh, that they've, um, they've got the first half of the deal completed in terms of selling tickets for a mission around the moon. The first return to the moon may be commercial. Even though it's only a loop-the-loop -loop out there, that's a bigger step than any nation has taken. Uh, SpaceX is giving the, uh, the Chinese a run for their money in terms of uh, launch prices in the commercial market, and goodness knows we as a nation and Florida could use a resurgence in that commercial launch market. Uh, and I think uh, uh, what Senator Nelson is doing and his colleagues uh, to give us the capability to have exploration vehicles uh, for uh, NASA crew to go to near-Earth asteroids and on to Mars, even back to the moon, which I'm a supporter of, those are all good things. But we are in a time of change, and some people um, don't see that. I wish more people would see the, the optimism the great number of positive threads uh, rather than um, uh, focus on uh, what we always have, which is a less than perfect situation. Senator Nelson, you wanted to say something? Yes, uh, Mike, I think this is a very important point that you've raised. Uh, you cited the column by uh, Neil and uh, uh, Jean, and uh, listen to the headline uh, just before that. You said it was May of 2010, that's exactly right. February the 1st, 2010, uh, actually January 30th, 2010, this was the Orlando Sentinel uh, headline, U.S. Space Surrender. Congress shouldn't go along with Obama's plan to yield America's leadership in exploration. The Florida Today headline on February 2nd, 2010, Lost in Space, and that was the perception then. And I think what you're hearing from the panel is there is a way forward. If Garrett is correct, and in three years, they can human rate the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule, that's 2014. We're going to have Americans on American rockets again. Uh, and you, you saw the... Um, uh, the well, now I can't remember what's been announced and what hadn't, so I better be careful, but uh, <laughs> let me just say, there are going to be a lot of exciting announcements coming up. I don't want to blow it. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, and ahead. you've already heard a lot of excitement. Bob mentioned uh, they're going to do the, the, the capsule uh, uh, assembly uh, for the big rocket. Uh, you will see a lot more commercial space development that will be announced in the future. Uh, there are going to be a, a lot of these things. And, and Garrett, we certainly hope you are successful because by 2014, we can have Americans blasting off. But remember, he's going to launch his rocket at the end of this year. It is going to rendezvous and dock with the space station, taking cargo and equipment, and is going to return equipment from the International Space Station. Gail Ketchum, you had something to add, but I wanted one point of clarification. That column I cited was uh, May 25th of this year. It was written on the uh, anniversary of uh, John F. Kennedy's speech about uh, going to the moon. Yeah, and, and I remember that. And, and uh, I mean, good grief, I don't think there's anybody in here that would argue that those gentlemen um, are, are and will always be uh, quintessential American heroes. Um, but I, I guess one of the things that has dawned on me as, as I've been wandering around is that we're always judging our space programs against Apollo. And, and clearly that was the quintessential American accomplishment. I mean, that's usually what we think of first when we say, what can America do? Unfortunately, that is absolutely, we could not have a worse benchmark to judge other programs from because the country cannot afford, nor should it, should it, it you have to remember what Apollo was. It was, the, it was the federal government, the president and Congress telling a federal agency, go do this, we don't care what it costs, just beat the Russians. Now, that's great if you're that agency, and clearly we rose to the occasion, and, and rightfully so, we're very proud of it. But the government can't, nor should it, and I would oppose, if they just told NASA, J just go to Mars, we don't care what it costs. That's, that's not going to happen, nor should it. We've got to figure out what's a program that's going to be sustainable. One that's, if, if we have vehicles that cost what Constellation was going to cost to fly, um, we're, we're going to lose. Because the, uh, NASA said the Ares 1 flight uh, Ares 1 to orbit for one American astronaut was going to be $600 million per seat. Now, we're griping because we're paying the Russians 50 or $60 million. Hell, I'm a taxpayer. I'd rather pay the Russians. The, the idea is we've got to get Americans uh, in, back into space on American vehicles as soon as possible, and the commercial sector is the way to do that. And we have to keep Americans, f and, and having that freeing up the money for NASA to do what taxpayers expect of NASA, which is to do the exploration, to do what hasn't been done before. And that money is freed up by investing in commercial to get to LEO. That frees up money for uh, the NASA to develop the programs to get beyond low Earth orbit and go explore the universe. But that is not going to happen if that system is not sustainable. We have to make the investments now, the capital investment now, to put in place a, a, a system that it doesn't cost three or four billion dollars every time you launch that vehicle. It's got to be cheap, because that's what we're going to, you know, if, if the Chinese get there tomorrow, you know, if they show up, plant a flag on the moon, that's great. They came in second by 30 plus years. If the Chinese show up on the moon and start mining, that's an entirely different matter. But they're not going to start mining unless they've got a system that's sustainable to, 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 to uh, be able to, to support that kind of activity. That's what we need to be focusing on, is a sustainable system. And, and as much as, as Neil and the other guys uh, are, are critical of what the president tried to do, um, it, I think that's what the president's intent was. Because if you remember, the Augustine Commission said they posited the question, why do we have a space program? What are we trying to do? And the answer was, we're going out into space to stay. And you can't stay if you don't have a sustainable system. So I, I think the, the perception that they bring to the table is not the one we need to have going forward. Well, let, let me uh, then go into a question that actually was my next one and, and have kind of a brief discussion. But uh, in 2004, when President Bush announced uh, that we would go to the moon, go to Mars afterwards. Um, on February 10, uh, 
President Obama announced he wanted to cancel that. Well, I remember some people were asking, well, go to the moon, we've been there already, so uh, why are we going back? Well, what is the imperative for um, um, going beyond low Earth orbit? What, what do you tell people is the reason why we ought to be doing this? The practical reasons that aren't, that, that aren't associated with some of the other uh, space activity like launching communication satellites so our GPS systems work. Um, Robert Cabana, could you talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, well, first off, it's, a, it's human destiny to explore, to go beyond, uh, to learn, to go beyond our means. Uh, we'd have never settled the United States had it not been for that. And it, it's our destiny to explore beyond our home planet, to expand our knowledge. <laughs> it's part of what it's all about, to be a world leader. People look for us to lead, and that's leadership in space. And we can abdicate that and become a second-rate nation, or we can remain a world leader. And that's what it's all about. The technology that feeds back. I mean, the jobs that we create within the space program, that uh, good jobs. And uh, it bleeds over into everything. I, I think it's just critical that we maintain our leadership and that we continue to explore and expand our knowledge. It's, it's us. It's who we are. Does anyone else want to talk about that? Uh, I completely agree as far as why going further, why go beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's everything that uh, Bob just said, but also it's also to inspire. Uh, I know the similar story that uh, Alan told about uh, how I got to be a geek um, and how I started looking in, in, into engineering was by watching films of the Apollo flights. I watched the Apollo 11, I had a Super 8 movie projector and I used to watch that film over and over. And it was the very uh, act of, of uh, that accomplishment of going to the moon which inspired me to, uh, to, to grow up and become an engineer and eventually, unbeknownst to me at the time, but become an astronaut. And so that, that pull is very important, that inspiration. When, when we continue to lead in space and we go beyond, and the destination to me actually is not that important. I just want to see us go, whether it's to the moon, Mars, a, a Lagrange point. They're all really interesting. This, this, the solar system is full of really cool places to go. Uh, so getting bogged down on A versus B is, is to me, pointless. We need to go, and in so doing, we're going to inspire the next generation of Americans to do to do more, to do better. And uh, to me, that's that's really what it's all about. Senator Nelson, you wanted to say something. May I add, in addition to what has been said so eloquently, look at the spinoffs. Uh, you remember uh, when you venture out and do new things, you develop new technologies and new techniques and new systems, and. Uh, uh, going into space, you have to have highly reliable systems that are light in weight and small in volume. That brought about the whole micro miniaturization uh, that we now enjoy in our daily lifestyles. Think about this CAT scans, MRIs came right out of the space program, the techniques developed. The, the life saving heart pumps use rocket engine technology. Think about the materials to protect astronauts on the EVA suits. Think how they apply to the military and the firefighters. Think about uh, automatic seat belts and airbags. That came from accelerometer technology in the space program. LASIK eye surgery came from precision guidance technology. Uh, and then the advanced environmental containment and cleanup technologies. These are just one, a few of thousands of these technologies that improve the quality of life that we have here on Earth. We have a really interesting mix up here of uh, people from the private sector and people from the government sector. And so I'm interested in hearing about the uh, relationship between um, uh, government, NASA, and, uh, and the commercial sector. Uh, it seems to be changing. Uh, you have entrepreneurs like Elon Musk uh, building his own rockets. Uh, Richard Branson is building a spaceship for tourists. Uh, Robert Bigelow wants to have uh, space hotels. Uh, I, I'd like for you all to talk about how that relationship is changing and whether it's what kind of tension it's creating uh, as far as uh, funding goes. Um, who would like to start with that? Someone, I'm sure. I could, uh, I could jump on that. The man beat. from SpaceX, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I'd like to say that it's, it's, it, this has been painted as a revolutionary approach, and it's really not 
as big of a deal as it's made out to be. Uh, the, the NASA has been working with contractors since the very beginning. It was contractors that built uh, the space shuttle, that built the Apollo rockets. Uh, and, and so the relationship has existed for a long time. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, what's really uh, different this time around is really something as mundane as contracting, the way that the government uh, does business. So what, what has happened with large procurement, uh, you know, when the government buys something like a new uh, fighter jet or a new aircraft carrier or something yeah. or a new rocket, uh, what's been, been done since World War II is typically it's done on a cost plus basis. So the companies, that the, the contractor that's building it will, uh, f you know, because there's so many unknowns, they, they do their work and say, well, it's costing us more money and, and here's the bill, Mr. Government, you know, here's our cost. They're valid costs, but you have to pay them. And, and uh, that, that can in provide good people with the wrong kind of incentives. What's different about what's happening now in commercial space is we're writing contracts that are commercial, milestone-based, and so we and fixed price. So we don't if we if we uh, hit a, a, a stumbling block technically, and and we have to invest some money to get past that. That's SpaceX money that gets spent. So we have skin in the game. We have a real uh, uh, incentive to keep it cost-effective. And so what this is is it's really taking the best of what private industry does. And at the same time, we have this tremendous resource, which is NASA, that knows how to get people into space. And so working together, leveraging all that corporate knowledge at NASA and the ability to get things done in a cost-effective manner in private industry is how we're able to build the Falcon 9 for only $300 million. So that, that partnership is, has been uh, really, really critical. And as we continue forward, uh, is, is, you know, we started out uh, with not a whole lot of interaction in the very beginning as we we're just developing our Falcon 1 rocket. As we got to uh, the Falcon 9 rocket and our contract to take cargo to the space station, we started getting to know each other a little bit better and uh, working together more closely, complying with more and more regulations and requirements that, are, that were needed to do something like bring a, a spaceship up to the International Space Station. And as we go forward into commercial crew, we're gonna get together even more and be even more uh, involved in, in a true partnership. Uh, as, uh, because we have to get NASA confident that not only are we giving them a good price, but we're giving them a safe vehicle. That is extremely important. It's extremely important not only for NASA and for those people who have to ride the vehicle. It's very important for SpaceX because your business case is really, really bad if your rocket doesn't work, okay? So, so that's the, the nature of the relationship, and we're still feeling each other out. There's, there's a bit of a difference in corporate culture. Uh, and, and we're still trying to find a way, there's still uh, obstacles that could come up along the way, but we're finding ways around those, and, and, uh, and it, it's essential that we do that. It's essential that we overcome any potential obstacle because this is the future, and this is our chance to get Americans back into space on a U.S. rocket uh, in, in any time soon, so uh, we have to be successful. Alan Stern, how do you see that? Well, I'd like to chip in a different perspective, maybe a little bit of an outsider's perspective since I've uh, only tangentially been involved in human space flight. Um, when, when I ran the science mission directorate, uh, the budget that I was responsible for was a little over $5 billion a year. And as I said earlier, uh, we were executing 90 separate uh, scientific missions from Earth science to astrophysics, planetary science, studying the sun, all that. Um, some of them very large, James Webb Space Telescope, Mars Science Lander, many billions of dollars, very large enterprises involving thousands and thousands of people in development, something more like the scale of um, human space flight, and some very small ones, uh, like the Aquarius satellite uh, that was just launched. But um, uh, the interesting thing was, here I had a, billion, a $5 billion budget, 93 separate flight programs we were responsible for. The guy down the hall from me, who was running the exploration division, um, uh, Doc Horowitz, um, had about a $5 billion budget coming uh, in the out years, but he only had one program um, called Constellation. And uh, so looking at it from the outsider's perspective, one thing that's different um, is that in human spaceflight, we've typically had one program at a time. We had Apollo, we replaced it with shuttle. A shuttle's been followed by the, the International Space Station, and now people talk about an exploration program. From my chair, I think it's a much healthier situation uh, to have a more diversified program. If human space flight, uh, and, and I know all the players that I've met, uh, no matter what commercial company they're from, 
um, love human spaceflight and uh, love the leadership aspects and think the uh, uh, think very much the way that the uh, government people do and the political people do about the importance of it to the United States. They all share those common beliefs. Um, if we could adapt to not a human spaceflight program, um, but instead a fabric of human spaceflight programs, some commercial, some government, some in partnership, um, multiple legs being back being able to get back and forth to orbit. Maybe multiple legs going out on the exploration side as well. I think we'd be in a healthier place. And, uh, and I think that some of the tension we see now is going from that single provider system to this multiple provider system is a cultural change. And it takes people a while to adapt to that. But in the end, I think it's for the best. Yes, Robert Cabana. I, well, I'd just like to add on to what Alan said. Uh, when the Constellation program uh, came to a close, uh, that was a, a blow to the team at KSC that was working on that. But that team, uh, you know, stepped back, and then we looked at what our requirements are for the future to really turn KSC into a multi-user uh, spaceport. And they started looking at, well, how can we enable commercial space? What does it require? And, and those folks that initially were kind of down, having lost their program, got looking at, well, what can the future be? How can we make this better? And they got really excited about what is required to transition KSC to the future. If you look at uh, Launch Complex 39 and you look at Pad B and you see the, the fixed service structure and the rotating service structure coming down from that 30-year shuttle pad that supported Apollo, uh, it looks like it's in disarray. But if you looked inside, underneath that pad, you would see that we replaced all the wiring, all the copper with fiber optics, all the control systems for the environmental control systems and the computer systems out there. It's all digital now. It's all new. It's all being transformed to support not only NASA's uh, heavy lift rocket of the future, but also to support uh, future commercial crew operations off that pad uh, to really make it uh, a spaceport. Um, you know, we have partnerships. Uh, we're not fighting with commercial companies. We're working together with them through Space Act agreements. Um, you know, we're working very closely with Space Florida here in the state. They've done an outstanding job. We're looking at taking excess capacity, uh, buildings that we no longer need uh, for the future for our heavy lift program uh, to support commercial operations, uh, turning them over, uh, working in negotiation with Space Florida to allow them to modify them and bring commercial companies in to operate and bring jobs to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Exploration Park, uh, in 2004, the state built a world-class life science lab at the Kennedy Space Center. We're gonna move the fence, get that outside the gate and make it an anchor point, a tenant for an industrial research park doing work that is part of the space program right there at KSC, bringing more jobs to the area. So I think we have a great partnership through our Space Act agreements with Space Florida to bring commercial work to the Cape. And if I look back on, on aviation, you know, when you think Orville and Wilbur flew that first flight, uh, December 17, 1903, it traveled a distance of about 120 feet, about the distance, the length of the orbiter, the space shuttle. And uh, aviation was kind of on a flat curve. And, you know, then you got into the, the 30s and we had the barnstormers and you could go pay for a ride in an old Jenny and uh, at the state fair or whatever or fly over your farm and that was pretty neat well that you know if you look at you know liken that to what XCOR and some of these uh, companies are doing Virgin Galactic they're taking people to space on a parabolic arc sure we did that you know 50 years ago but it's exciting, it's generating interest, it's getting people involved in, in space. And, and that's kind of like where those barnstormers were. And aviation took off exponentially. We're still back on that flat part of the curve as far as space is concerned. But it's gonna continue to grow and take off as technology improves, as cost comes down. And uh, we are working with commercial industry to make that happen. Yeah. Dale Ketchum, I see you uh, wanted to follow up, but maybe uh, maybe I could also plant a seed here. Um, I'm interested in, in your take on uh, what, it's, what it would take for Kennedy Space Center to transition uh, from uh, an, an operations center to a, a place where maybe there's more research and development. And, and maybe you can also address, uh, will, will we ever see uh, employment levels at uh, Kennedy Space Center back to uh, where they were very recently? Well, I, I, I guess to answer your, uh, to get, let me, let me take your first question first about uh, what <laughs> diversification at KSC, I think that's one of the things we've been working on for a long time and we have a real opportunity and it's, it's an opportunity 
that KSC has not done a lot of research. We're not known for that. We're not a research center. We're always just an ops. We do operations. And uh, to refer back to the comment that, uh, that Alan made about if you only own one stock, you deserve what you get when it goes down. And if you're just an ops center, <clears throat> you're fat and happy when the program's bumping along. But when it cycles down, you take it in the shorts. And, and I, get, I, I found it interesting because um, when I started college at the University of Florida in 1972, my dad was in real estate in Cocoa Beach. Well, that happened to be the year that they canceled the Apollo program. And I did not, uh, I was a dumb freshman at University of Florida, and so I really wasn't attentive to the fact my dad was putting me through college when he was dying, in, when, when the Apollo program was canceled, and it was devastating in East Central Florida. And it was because every, I mean, the, I think work out there was almost 30,000 people, and it dropped to like 15,000 15, people in, in uh, like a year. I mean, it was just this huge blow to the economy. And it, I, I noticed that when Apollo canceled, I went to college. And now shuttle's being canceled, and next week my oldest son starts University of Florida, and shuttle's being canceled, and the economy's going to take a bad hit here. And I, I think part of my motivation, again, is to try to help assure that the, the, the model of KSC is diversified so that when my grandkid goes to college and the next program cycles down, we don't take it in the shorts again, that we're doing what, what I know University of Central Florida is very involved in, is we're trying to help KSC establish the capability to do more in technology development and R&D in all of these things that helps diversify your business model. I mean, that's just simple economic good business practice to diversify your business model. And I think there are real opportunities there. And again, it gets back to the comment I made before. What we want is a sustainable system, one that doesn't cost an arm and a leg and doesn't inhale the agency's entire budget just to run the transportation system. And the way I think we can do that is to directly involve KSC because at the end of the day, the bulk of the costs of operating the systems are borne at Kennedy Space Center. We're better to rely on that expertise to help design systems that operate that much more cheaply. And KSC needs to be the test bed for the agency to be testing new models and to have the dedicated institutionalized budget and resources to pursue new technologies to lower costs so your operating systems costs are going down and it's cheaper to work so that NASA has the money to spend in what goes at the end of the rocket instead of just processing the vehicle. Okay, I think Senator Nelson had something to say and then Alan Stern, you wanted to contribute. Yes, sir. Uh, I think it's important to ask the question that Dale raised, why is the space shuttle program being shut down? That decision was made by the investigation board headed by Admiral Gaiman called the Columbia Accident Investigation Board after we lost the second space shuttle earlier in the decade. And what they said in their report was, you fly the shuttle just as long as you have to in order to build the space station because the shuttle is unique in that it has the big cargo bay to carry up 45,000 pounds. And once you complete the space station, you replace it with a safer rocket, a rocket that by its very design does not have the inherent uh, potential uh, problems that we've seen in losing 14 people out of thus far 134 missions. And, and so the, the problem over the years, once that was decided back in the early part of eight years ago, then the question was, well, were we going to get the new rocket in time by the time the space shuttle was shut down? And this is where, over the last seven, eight years, NASA has been starved of funds, while at the same time spending $9 billion on the Constellation program. And that led us to this point of reevaluating through 
the prestigious Norman Augustine Blue Ribbon Commission in charting the path that ultimately was put into law last October. And that's the course that we're on. Now, these two last fl shuttle flights were not supposed to fly. After the destruction of Columbia, this payload that just went, and Alan, I wish you'd come in on this, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, it's only been up there a few weeks, and, it, and it's collected a billion of these cosmic particles that they are now analyzing to determine all of the architecture of subatomic particles. Uh, that wasn't supposed to fly. We added that flight. And Atlantis coming up, STS-135, that was not on the manifest either. We added that. We specifically did that not only to get the AMS up and this other equipment that's going up, but also to have a more gentle slope in what's happening out at KSC in the employment as then they ramp up. And later this year, you're going to hear the announcements of how much money they're going to put in to additionally modernize the Space Center. Remember in the budget, in the President's proposal, it's, it's $1.9 billion over the next five to six years. And in, in the NASA authorization bill, it's $1.6 billion over the next three years. We'll just wait until you hear the announcements that are coming later on. And so, uh, I, I think to put into context the situation that we find ourselves and now playing catch up with a safer rocket, at some point you all might explain, you know, how it is that these new rockets are actually going to be safer for astronauts uh, compared to the space shuttle. Well, Thank Alan you. Stern, you had, uh, you had something to say? There we go. Uh, I, I will echo uh, what Senator Nelson said about uh, AMS and also uh, 135 um, as good things that we could use that hardware uh, both to improve space station and to get that better ramp in terms of the end of the program for the local area. But speaking of the local area, first I want to say I'm not so sure I want to sit quite as close to Dale with um, his, his family's timing with economic cycles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that. But I, I want to echo a point he made, uh, uh, besides your karma point. Uh, you know, um, in Florida, I think that um, because of the long history of um, the kind of work that's been done at the Cape, um, most people I run into when I'm down here tend to think of uh, their intersection with NASA as the human spaceflight program. And I think that's wonderful, but I also think it's, it's leaving a lot of work and a lot of uh, potential on the table. Um, one third of the agency is science. There's also um, a very significant aeronautics program. There are other programs as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know that uh, we can establish this um, uh, right here, but I believe that Florida is uh, in one of the uh, last place slots in terms of uh, science budget that comes to NASA, to states as uh, given its very large population on a per capita basis, Florida is pretty far behind uh, much smaller states like my own in Colorado. Uh, now the University of Central Florida has got a great toehold in the space sciences and they've established a great planetary group. University of Florida in Gainesville has got a great astrophysics group. Um, and in the science program, individual professors and scientists can win billion dollar missions and bring them home uh, not just to make the discoveries, but uh, f uh, for economic reasons. And, uh, you know, everybody's proud of that kind of work. And so uh, as you think about uh, how you intersect with NASA, think again about a different kind of diversification to other parts of NASA and how universities like UCF, for example, can help be a part of that solution because I think there's tremendous promise there. Robert Cabana, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Dale said. First off, yes, KSC is known as an ops center. Uh, we launch rockets, absolutely. But uh, within the agency, uh, we also have a reputation for being a very, very good R&D center. Uh, Bobby Braun is a new chief technologist uh, for NASA, and he came down and, and visited and saw some of the projects that we were working on. And we compete very well with all the other NASA centers for the R&D dollars that come out of his uh, mission directorate up at NASA headquarters. 
So I would say we are doing R&D and we are recognized for it and we're gonna continue to grow it. Um, you know, if I look at some of the things we're doing, uh, remember when we had all the problems with the wiring on the orbiter and the breaks in the insulation, we've developed self-healing wiring. It knows when it has a short and it fixes itself. Uh, we're looking at electrostatic control of dust as we go to the moon and Mars and uh, dust gets on solar rays and stuff and equipment, uh, how to keep it off uh, automatically. Um, I, there's just one thing after another. We're doing um, the communications architecture for uh, when we go to the moon and Mars and these other places and how we communicate and set up operations on the ground. It's KSC engineers and technologists that are out helping uh, set all that up. And I, I could go on and on. There's a, a great amount of R&D that's done at KSC, and we want to continue to grow that. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, Exploration Park, as we draw universities and other researchers in, can help capitalize on that and, uh, and expand it further. As far as the workforce goes, uh, having researched this, uh, back at the peak of Apollo, there were 25,000 contractors and civil servants working at the Kennedy Space Center, and it dropped down to about 8,500. Uh, we built back up during shuttle. At one point, we were up to 18,000 after the uh, Challenger accident. But for the last eight to 10 years, it leveled off at about 15,000 contractors and civil servants. Uh, right now, over the past uh, year and a half or so, we've come down to about 12,000, 11,800, and we're gonna go down to around 8,200 or so. But then we're gonna start building back up. And by 2016, 2017, we hope to be up around 10,000 or so. And, and it's gonna remain stable. We don't wanna be dependent on these large uh, government programs that come and go, but we wanna have a stable base in uh, Brevard County in Florida at Kennedy Space Center. Of those uh, you know, 10,000, we're gonna maintain about a constant 2,000 civil servants and then the contractors uh, where we're gonna see the fluctuations. But uh, it's, it's a positive future. No, we're not gonna have the full 15,000 that we may have had but we're gonna have a stable, uh, very good uh, 10,000 uh, good jobs. It's very difficult, uh, what the transition that we're going through. I understand that, it's hard. I've had people come up to me after some of these layoffs and you know, Bob, 28, 32 years working on the space shuttle and, and what they say to a person is, I'm just so glad to have been part of this, to be able to have been part of America's space program. Um, Right now, the team that is processing Atlantis and getting ready for this last mission, they are totally dedicated to ensuring that it's done absolutely perfect. Uh, it's just, this is the most amazing uh, group of technicians and engineers anywhere in the world. And we need to capitalize on that and uh, bring some more good work in for them. Okay. Well, our, our time is, flying by, and I have in my hand a big stack of questions that Paul tells me are quite good. Be so, get but to Garrett Reisman has yeah. something to add quickly. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity and answer uh, the Senator's question about uh, safety and uh, touch upon also s uh, some of the things that Bob has said. Um, when we, my last mission was on Atlantis, STS-132, just about one year ago. And when we landed, we stepped out of the vehicle on, on, the, uh, on the ground there at Kennedy at the shuttle landing facility, looked up at the bird, and um, boy, if she didn't look like she was ready to go again, you know? Uh, so at the time, we didn't, there was a lot of uncertainty, and, and uh, we were supposed to be the last flight of Atlantis back then. So I want to say that we had faith in you, Senator, because our crew started calling it the first last flight of Atlantis, <laughs> and I'm really happy that that turned out to be the case. So. But, but like I said, the, the shuttle is an amazing machine, and I will never forget that feeling of pride I had standing on the runway that day looking up at her. But the thing is, the shuttle is the most amazing flying machine ever devised. The things it can do are extraordinary. Its capabilities are tremendous. The ability to carry not only people, but larger elements of the, of the space station up to orbit, to do a spacewalk out of it, to have its own robot arm. These were all things, and, and, and to, and, and to uh, uh, land and re-enter uh, as a winged vehicle. All those capabilities, uh, we are not gonna have all that. We're not gonna be able to replace all that with the Falcon 9 and, and the Dragon. But nor do we want to. The, the lesson that we learned is that by adding all that capability, you also add a, a lot of risk and you also uh, let a lot of, add a lot of expense. What we're trying to do is come up with, as mentioned before, a sustainable and safe program to get people into low Earth orbit. And so what we're, what we're learning is a lot of that safety comes from simplicity of design. Don't try to do everything for everyone. 
Just know what your core mission is and focus on that and make it as simple as possible. Have the fewest things that could go wrong on your ship. And for an example, the Falcon 9 and Dragon, we have fewer staging events or mechanical events that have to occur for a safe flight than even the Soyuz does. <coughs> we, um, for example, our launch abort system is, is contained inside the vehicle. The engines that will separate you in case of, of an emergency, instead of the old way of doing it, which is having it up on top of the rocket, what that means is if everything's going fine, you have a, an additional action that the rocket has to complete successfully for you to have a successful flight, which is jettisoning that escape vehicle. We, we eliminated that. So wherever possible, we eliminate risk, make it simple, and that's how you get both safety and uh, cost effectiveness. And safety is something that's very uh, near and dear to my heart because one, ultimately, I hope to be strapping my friends uh, into this vehicle, and uh, it's not just some amorphous blob. I know these people. And secondly, uh, I had a, a lot of friends, and I was in the astronaut office uh, when we lost Columbia. And uh, I never, ever want to go through something like that again. So that's what's driving our designs. And uh, I believe we will have a vehicle that will be uh, an order of magnitude more safe than anything that's flown before. OK, thank you. Let's, let's get to a couple of these questions. Uh, the first one is uh, directed to Senator Nelson. And it's from John O'Brien, who asks, uh, you state NASA has a clear path at the moment. But what happens when we get a new president who can change it all again? And if, if you all could keep your answers uh, fairly brief, because I'd like to get a few of these. <clears throat> well, that's an important uh, question, because what we've seen is, depending on the administration, you have the changes. Well, for the first time now, we have a policy etched in law that will take us on parallel paths with regard to launch vehicles, one, the commercial rockets to and from the space station and allow the space station to do what it was designed to do, and that is science and research. And the second parallel path, uh, the big rocket that will allow NASA to go out and explore the heavens. Uh, so uh, that's a policy that's not going to be changed. Now. Unless Congress changes it. Well. Uh, un unless uh, one of the threats is the funding. And uh, this country is facing a critical uh, set of decisions on how are we going to bring down the deficit. Now, in the first round of those cuts, which just occurred earlier this year, uh, NASA came out very well. Uh, NASA was funded last year at approximately $18.7 billion, and with every other agency getting huge whacks in the continuation on the final funding for this current year that we're in, uh, NASA was funded at $18.5 billion. The House of Representatives had passed their appropriation, and it was $18.1 whether or not we can keep that 18.5 going for years into the future is still to be determined. But that's probably the biggest uh, question with regard to the future. The path is set. The policy is there. NASA, on a daily basis, is announcing that policy. The commercial rocket guys are constantly coming out and performing their milestones. Now the question is, what's the funding? We have another question that's not directed to anyone in particular, but uh, asking, um, what are the prospects for space tourism? I'll speak, I'll speak to that to start. First of all, I think they're very, very good. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of pinup desire for that. Uh, the suborbital companies uh, that are all now in flight test, every one of them has vehicle, one or more vehicles in flight test. I believe Virgin uh, just flew four flights in 48 hours this week. Um, they're doing approach and landing tests, which you remember the shuttle started with before powered flights. Um, but you can go down the list. Um, they're, they're all reaching flight test stage. Um, are uh, looking at daily or in some cases multiple flights per day. Virgin has sold hundreds of tickets uh, at $200,000 a pop. And when the prices come down, I think they'll sell a lot more. Um, Xcor has had very good success with their sales, and you can go through the list. 
In addition, companies like Space Adventures are selling much more expensive rides uh, initially to low Earth orbit and, and then to uh, uh, these lunar type flights uh, like announced with the Russians. Uh, but I think that um, the prospects are very bright. The Bigelow space stations, the onset of systems like Dragon um, with Falcon 9 that are going to get those 50, 60 million dollar orbital prices down a factor of several um, make it uh, a very bright future. I'll tell one quick story. Um, uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, Richard Garriott, flew on, uh, on um, one of the Soyuz missions to ISS as a space tourist. His dad was Owen Garriott. I served with Owen on the NASA Advisory Council. When Richard flew, um, uh, he had made his money uh, in computer games, and he wanted to be an astronaut, but he didn't have good enough eyes, so he, he did it himself. He made his money, and he bought his ticket. And when he flew, he spent 30-something million dollars, but he monetized his flight and sold his time um, and he, he recouped about $9 million. He said, a lot of people think I'm not such a smart businessman because <laughs> I spent 30 to $35 million to make nine. He said, well, that wasn't the point. Here's the point. He says, that was easy to make that nine. He said, when prices drop to nine or $10 million, I can fly as often as I want. I think there's gonna be a lot of this. If I could ask quickly, just to follow up, are any of those space tourism uh, uh, startups going to fly out of uh, Cape Canaveral? Um, as a matter of fact, um, I believe there, and um, I don't know if Frank DeBello is in the audience or somebody from Space Florida, others at the table may know, I believe uh, those that have um, mobile basing like Virgin and x -Core, um have been in discussions about um, conducting some flights or maybe basing some vehicles here in Florida. And I think Cecil Field is now a FAA recognized uh, spaceport. I, I just want to speak for uh, SpaceX here. The, the um the, the, our focus right now is our partnership with NASA, both getting cargo up to the station and when we talk about the flying people, we're talking about flying NASA astronauts up, up to the station. So we're focused on NASA's needs and requirements and, and, uh, and, and fulfilling that uh, arena. Uh, it's not to say that uh, once we get a sustainable and, and uh, safe vehicle up and running that we wouldn't en en entertain other options. I won't rule that out. But I can tell you right now, as I design the inside of the Dragon vehicle, I don't have any provisions to pass out hot towels for people to <laughs> wipe their hands with. Uh, and and uh, so we won't have a spa in there. Uh, you know, so our focus is NASA. Uh, well, and I have another question here for Gary Reisman, uh, which is, uh, why isn't a company like uh, SpaceX based in Florida? Is Florida not a competitive location for the commercial space industry? And maybe Dale Ketchum could follow up on that as well. Well, you know, we do have a large operation in, in, in Florida, and it's growing. Uh, this is definitely where 80% of the rockets that are on our manifest that we're going to launch over the next five years will all launch out of Florida. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, 60 employees now and $5 million in, in payroll, which is uh, a start, but we intend to have that grow, potentially reaching over 600 uh, employees. So um, we, we tend to be very active here in Florida. We spent $10 million on improvements to our launch pad. And uh, last year, we spent $8 million on Florida-based suppliers, uh, mostly to uh, get that work done on the launch pad. So uh, it, it is, uh, you know, Florida is an attractive place to do business. Um, we, uh, you know, I think we'll continue to look for opportunities to do more of that business. And in fact, what we're, we're talking about um, if given the opportunity to, to uh, compete for the, the super launch, uh, the heavy lift vehicle, uh, we have preliminary plans to build those tanks, which would be required right next to our facility at the launch pad. So we would do that work here in Florida. So when it makes sense, we're, we're always looking for ways to, uh, to uh, do our business where it makes sense. Dale Ketchum, what, what's it going to take for Florida to compete? Well, I, I, I think we're... I think we're um, we're doing very well. I think uh, if, if uh, as Senator Nelson said, there are a number of significant announcements that are going to be made at the federal level um, that, that are really going to be encouraging because I think one of the problems we've dealt with is there are so many thousands of people being laid off and there's been a, uh, an, an, a, a perception of a lack of direction in Washington. But that, that's, I, I, I think we're going to get that direction uh, real soon. I mean, it's there already, but it's going to be uh, codified, for lack of a better characterization. But the, the concern has been people don't know what we're going into. But I think oh, by the end of the summer and early fall, 
I think people are going to recognize where we're going to be going, and the fact that there's a light at the end of the tunnel is going to make the difficult times we're going to go through that much at least bearable, because at least if people know what's coming, as opposed to just being an open-ended tunnel, at least there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But I think what, what uh, and, and, and Space Florida is, is going to be rolling out its own level of announcements uh, over the next couple of months, and Frank debello has got a, a number of really great projects in his queue. Uh, and, and there's some really smart people that have worked in this for a long time, and it's going to bear fruit. Uh, Florida's already uh, quite com competitive. I, I, I think, you know, e Elon wanted to design his own thing. There's, you know, California is still California, and there's a lot of technology and really smart, innovative people, and that's where Elon set up his shop, and it's understandable, and clearly it worked for him. Elon's not going to move all that activity here until there's a business model that shows that's a profitable. Elon's a businessman. That's what you want running this. But I think one, one of the encouraging things, I, I've been at both of Elon's um, parties that they held after they had a successful launch, and, and I really got to tell you, it was, it was really inspirational to me because uh, having grown up in Cocoa Beach and, and been at, at early launch parties for Gemini and Apollo and... and, and uh, when people were were really celebrating something, when you went to these parties, there was a. What was impressive to me is they were almost all young people, I mean under 30. There was a few gray beards and some elements of leadership, and they, uh, and there was some billionaire at the bar buying all the drinks, um, but there was there was a whole bunch of young people, and you could tell they were excited. They were they they because. They had achieved this. They had done this work. They had had their hands on it, and it was just incredible. To, see. to me, there's nothing more inspirational to young people to get involved in math and science than to see young people succeeding because they got into math and science. And it was really nostalgic, for lack of a better term, for me. But I think the, 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 one of the things, going back to one of the earlier questions, one of the ways that I think we can help control costs for NASA is this more diversified model that, 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 that Bob's working towards of bringing more people onto Kennedy Space Center and having a, the, the tapestry that was discussed earlier because NASA is going to be exposed instead of being in this insulated cocoon where they're just working on their program, there's going to be a bunch of other people involved in a lot of the private sector and just the uh, uh, being in proximity with people who think differently, who do things differently have different processes who are, who are based on, you know, saving money and cost efficiency, that having NASA more exposed to that, uh, you know, they're inculcated deeply with the safety. I don't think we're going to worry about that, but just learning how to do things better because NASA can't continue to have grossly over budget things like Constellation or, or the one now, the James Webb Telescope, which is 500 percent over budget. I mean, programs like that that's what kills it. I mean, that, that's, that was what was brought up at the Republican uh, debate in New Hampshire was NASA not performing well on some projects, but they do great on others, and we got to make sure what they're doing here they're great at. One of our guests here today asks, uh, is it time to rethink manned space flight and concentrate on more efficient, less expensive unmanned missions? Who would like to take that one? Well, the unmanned mission guy would like to take that on, uh, and, and I, I would say emphatically not, uh, that it's not a choice between those two things. They really serve very different purposes. And I think, uh, uh, after all, look, this is America. We lead. We lead in human spaceflight because it's what we're about. We're not going to put that pencil down. Thank you.